I guess one of the taglines for today is actually digitalization threat or opportunity. And I guess this is part of the threat when the technology doesn't work. Uh, okay, so what are we gonna do today? Uh, we're gonna start off today uh, by me and Vinit doing a quick research presentation on some of the work that we've been doing in the Dig-In project. Uh, and then we're gonna actually have some quite exciting presentations from Ericsson and ABB. Uh, Mikael and Mats uh, share some of their views about what are the key challenges facing industry right now. Uh, and then of course we want to allow you to have the opportunity to reflect and share your learnings. We're gonna do a small uh, workshop and really trying to see, okay, so, well, there is a lot of challenges, but how can you address them? And how can you work together to really profit from digitalization? And then, of course, we want to end the day on a good note and take away some conclusions. So that's the broad agenda. Great. So then to the first topic, uh, very quickly, a uh, lot of content, too little time. So we have tried to squeeze in as much as we can uh, into the session. We are here actually representing a research project called DIGIN, and it's, it's very much about digital business model innovation. But I think what is unique about this project is also industrial ecosystems. And I think that is something we think is a key part when we're starting to talk about digital business model that I, I think we haven't been discussing enough. And of course, we're going to talk about opportunities, challenges, as well as some lessons learned uh, around this. And the agenda for this part of 30 minutes presentation is to a little bit introduce ourselves to give you some example of the key theoretical concepts that we have come across and that we want us to have a formal vocabulary when we are discussing here business model, for example. What does that really mean beyond just the trendy word? Um, we also want to draw some scenarios for you, which I think would be quite exciting to think about from an industrial shift point of view of what is happening and how you should think about digital business models. We're going to present you three traps related to digitalization, which we think many large companies are faced with in different forms. Uh, we're going to present you five lessons for, regarding how to profit from digital business model innovation. And finally, a key takeaway, a slide that kind of summarizes everything together. A little bit about ourselves. Uh, myself, I'm professor uh, at Entrepreneurship Innovation Research Group, and David is associate professor. We have been working on many different topics, and one of the topics that has been very core for us, and we have been working since 2010, has been the shift of manufacturing companies or product-centric companies, which is very dominant in Sweden, towards more services. Servitization has been something that we have been looking very much into. And how we really started into that topic was actually, it was a lot of the engineering guys up at LTU that had come up with this, okay, performance-based solution is very interesting. But when they started working this in an excellent center, they realized that quite quickly that, you know, companies couldn't just, it's not about technology, it's about business model, it's about business model innovation. And you really need to change all parts of how you create, deliver, and capture value to be able to profit from, well, both servitization and digitalization. Maybe five years back, we have started to tag along to digitalization more as an enabler. And I think this is also something we think is, uh, you, you can almost see it as an amplifier to the servitization strategy of many companies that have been pursuing for a while. Uh, and I think that is an interesting combination here. And quite often, as I was trying to talk about, also this industrial ecosystem perspective around digitalization. And then, of course, both me and Vinit have a background from our PhDs on doing research on open innovation and managing more collaborative relationships among companies. And I think that is still a core that we have with us in, in, the, in the research work that we are doing right now. And finally, to also connect it to something which, which I think personally also believe and is very important is around circular economy or sustainable industry. And I think the combination of digitalization, servitization, and new business model is the goal towards getting closer to a sustainable industry. And this is something we have been trying to connect and trying to at least have in back of our mind as we have worked through these different research topics. Altogether, we have been publishing a lot of academic uh, articles. As you can imagine, we have more than 200 uh, papers published in different formats, journal papers and conference papers we write towards industrial publication. Uh, had an article at Ericsson Business Review some time back. We, of course, are part of blogs as well. Uh, and we are very grateful to the funding we have been able to cap gather from uh, Swedish foundations. And I think the one that is very much sponsoring this event to a large extent is Vinova, and we are quite grateful to their contribution on this topic. So, okay, so some of the key, what we really want to present to, today is very much about uh, what we've been working on on the last three years, basically. 
uh, where we have been doing more than 200 interviews on the topic of digital business model innovation in a B2B setting. So that is quite important to, to remember also that we're not talking about the digital business models, digital solutions to the consumer, but we're very much in an industrial setting. So we've been working with companies like Boolead and ABB, uh, Volvo Construction Equipment and Ericsson, and, and looking into how can they uh, work better together with their uh, customers and their suppliers to realize the benefit from digitalization. Um, so we have also been leading uh, the, well, this uh, dig-in project through, for multiple uh, years. And uh, a key strength of this project has actually been that we have been involved in multiple industrial ecosystems. So we're involved in mining, forestry, uh, also within the construction sector and, and manufacturing. Uh, as well as telecom and transport, transportation that has been quite uh, recent additions and very recently we have even been looking into maritime. So we can see that these uh, trends and these shifts are happening throughout uh, but it's very interesting to look into the, the ecosystem and how, uh, how uh, not just one provider but multiple providers can work together to reach for example higher productivity for Boolean than if you look at the far left or right maybe from your side. So what is the new logic uh, that we are talking about when we are talking about digital business model? And I think the starting point is towards sustainable industry and I was trying to emphasize that also at our recent talk. So it's very much about how can we ensure achieving economical, environmental and social benefit, you know, hitting the bullseye. I think it's easier to say than to do. At the end of the day, we always end up talking about financial gain. But I think it's important to have that vision and have that as an approach. And we think digitalization as an enabler towards sustainable industry. And one of the missing puzzle in this equation is business models. And quite often what we are very much thinking about is how as an individual company, I should change my business model so I can achieve this gain and you know, profit from digitalization. And I think that is a wrong entry into the dialogue because what you should be thinking about is how should my business model with other actors' business model together achieve higher productivity in the industrial sector. And I think that is a difficult question because it kind of goes beyond your bound and you know beyond your mandate and what you can actually manage. But that is where the real values lie. I mean, you can optimize an equipment, but if you can optimize the whole process, that's where the highest value would lie for the customer. And then how do you achieve that if you have mixed equipment in a customer setup? Um, so, of course, we have a lot of the trendy words. Uh, connected to, to our presentation. So digitalization, for example, what, what does that mean? We, uh, there's a lot of enabling technologies that are being more and more prevalent and being cheaper and being easier to apply. So Internet of Things, automation, remote monitoring, predictive maintenance, artificial intelligence is so key on the agenda too. Of course, some of the enabling factors here are basically, okay, so we have a cheaper and more prevalent sensors that are built able to collect a lot of data, we are having better connectivity and we're also being able to use all this data to, and use analytics to optimize and uh, really increase performance. Uh, but truly what, what digitalization means for us is not about the technology, it's about how you use these technologies to provide new both revenue but also value producing opportunities uh, in an industrial ecosystem setting. So that is maybe the, the key definition that we also want to thank you to take with you. And when companies are trying to apply digital digitalization as a part of an offering, I mean, they are doing it in many different ways. I mean, we have example of fleet management solution from Scania. You could think about site management system or site control system or construction equipment. You can think about life cycle services, you know, cost per ton contract that METSO has towards police. And uh, you can also think about digital platform solution like MyAppyRock, MyABB, uh, you can also think about uh, autonomous mining equipment solution from Sandvik Mining. You can think about portfolio approach from a digitalized digital solution for possibilities with ABB ability or preventive maintenance contracts. So as you can see, there are different ways companies are doing and what they're doing at the core level is going through a transformation, coming up with different offerings. And as they enter into these dialogues, uh, they are faced with the challenge of that the existing dominant product-based business model doesn't fulfill the benefit you can get out of these digital technologies. And if you do it, what you are faced with that either you create too much value and you can't capture it back or you are capturing the wrong values. And you know, I think it, there is a misfit here. 
So we need to very much look into the business model. And as David was also trying to talk about, a business model defines how you create value, how you deliver value, and how you capture value, right? And then what does each of these components mean? Well, when you're talking about how you create value, you're very much thinking about the offering. You're thinking about what unique customer needs you are addressing, what are the unique benefits you will go for. And if once you have come up with that offering that you will be delivering to the customer in whichever combination of product, service, software, competence, you need to make sure that you are able to deliver on that promise. How are you going to organize your delivery organization? How, what capabilities do you know internally, need internally? Which capabilities would you need to form through strategic partnerships? All those are interesting. And of course, revenue model, risk structure, uh, these are very important. Uh, and I think what we don't talk enough about is the alignment between these components. You could be very good in one of them, but not so good in others. And what would that lead to is what we call value leakage. And that happens, happens quite often uh, for many of these companies. This is an example of ecosystem. Um, and I think we have the creator of this figure too, John sitting there uh, from Ericsson. And this was a good way of illustrating, you know, this was just a hypothetical case that we were discussing like, you know, four or five years back, trying to think about smart ventilation solution and how Gulidan could actually uh, be offered that. From Gulidan point of view, they would just like to have one contract that solves the problem. I mean, a ventilation solution is quite exciting. I mean, it is, uh, I, I know many people from ABB are here. There's a big energy, uh, you know, consumer uh, function. And, you know, it's also a function that has nothing to do with the Gulidan's core competence. It's not a function that they would like to kind of work too much with. But if you could do that, then the question of course comes, should we redesign the product to be sold in as a service? And I think it's a relevant question to ask. You should be thinking about how it would be used and what features it should have, and it should be changed in a way. You know, a simplistic example would be adding sensors and making fan maybe in a different way. What communication platform would it be connected with within the customer side then? You know, what would be the point opportunities to get that insights? Maybe there is a role for new actors like Mobilaris in this case, you know, who are coming up with smart tags. Um, and all that somehow needs to be orchestrated by an individual actor. Is ABB the right person, company to do that, or it should be someone else? Uh, should it be done in a consortium, risk revenue sharing agreement, in what format it should be done? And I think all these questions are very relevant when we are starting to think about digital business modeling. So let's draw two scenarios for you related with digital business modeling that kind of illustrates the need for new business model and why it is so vital. Um. Okay, so how do we in the Swedish industry really derive our competitiveness? Uh, so for a long time, it has been very much about product innovation. And, you know, we have had quite superior capabilities in many different industries. We have close understanding of the customer needs and all those things. So, um, but I don't know if that's enough anymore. Uh, for the last 20, 30 years, we have probably been looking into services as a way to drive revenue growth and, and get us closer to the companies, we, uh, our customers, uh, and, and reach competitiveness. But that has also not been that easy. We have seen quite mixed results. Many companies have gone out to the, to the service side and, uh, and really tried to build up a service organization only to realize that, okay, we're not really profiting here. And then they have scaled back and, and tried to consolidate to the core, go back to the product. And now, of course, we're seeing the shift with digitalization. And we're talking maybe about smart products, basically combining product innovation, service innovation, and the digital components. And then it starts to be maybe interesting. But of course, this is a big shift for the industry. And that is not all. So the whole products can be changing. Uh, in many of our industries right now, we see that, okay, so we're going towards electrification. So we're changing from the traditional combustion-based engine to some electrical vehicles and, uh, and totally different types of drive lines and technologies. We're also going much more into autonomous, autonomous trucks, autonomous uh, buses, autonomous ships. All of these are slowly uh, reaching commercial uh, potential. And then of course, we're talking about connectivity. So what is really happening here? Well, if you look at the uh, truck from Scania or Volvo trucks, um, Forty percent of their value creation would typically come from the powertrain and engine, which was a combustion base and which was very much based on their mechanical skills. Now that may not be the case anymore if we're talking electrical. 
or at least they need to build new capabilities. 20% could be from the just designing the cab and having a good driver environment and supporting the driver. But if it's autonomous, then that value doesn't exist anymore also. So if the truck starts to look like that, autonomous, electrified, and without any driver, where is Volvo and Scania in, the, in that case? And how do they cope with this threat of missing 60% of their existing value creation? And I guess the solution can be in finding a different role within their ecosystem and, and taking a new value creation. So another example uh, of viewing digitalization as a threat or an opportunity is, you know, around mine automation. And I think the reason we talk about mine a lot is because we think there is much happening related to digitalization in this particular sphere. And one of the reason is purely because the efficiency improvement is quite high. Uh, and it's also a controlled environment. It actually fits many of the boxes when you think about automation. Uh, so my information and you know draw a scenario like that you have mixed fleets right I mean this is a common challenge uh, and I guess from many perspectives customers would like to have it right but each, each company's digital solution somehow needs to be configured in a, you know into a common system and now I'm simplifying it you know because you can think about a maintenance system to a logistical system to whatever systems right there are many systems that are needed but at a simplistic level, there has to be some orchestrating happening. Uh, and then the question is, who's going to be active in this player? And you know, how are, who's going to kind of make the money? Because everyone would like to be there. Mm -hmm. Scenario num and, and we see many scenarios happening right now. And the most dominant one, of course, is that each machine provider is pushing out many of these digital solutions. And this is not that really attractive, if you think about it from a customer point of view. Unless they have a very dominant fleet with your equipment and uh, probably fear of locking an effect further by buying a digital solution from you. You know, it's a risky proposition if you think about it from their point of view. But maybe it will happen. I think it's challenging. The other is that to a larger extent, customers are quite tired and they have started to build their own system where everyone else needs to feed into. I fear that that strategy is also not very smart uh, because this is not their core competence. And I think before probably their system like that is launched, it's outdated. And what is the incentives for global players like Sandvik or, you know, Epiroc to invest into customer system if there is no revenue to be made there? The third scenario could be <laughs> ABV or Siemens or, you know, the backbone of a technological system coming in and doing that integration. That could happen, uh, but they may actually lack competence knowledge to a certain extent. I think there is also another part with new entrants coming into play, Mobilaris, new tracks, and I think this is actually very attractive. They don't have the heritage of the product. They can have open platform and they can actually provide much more higher level of customization or exclusivity towards customers. But there is a, you know, it's a very critical function. Do you want actually an SME to do that? But, you know, I think we shouldn't rule them out. And I definitely want to put the global leaders also trying to enter with AI functionalities into the scenarios. I think everyone would have a role here. What role they would have is not very clear. And let me put in one more idea. The scenario number, scenario X and Y, Z, one scenario I see is ecosystems competing with ecosystems. Uh, without taking names, I think here already you can see two dominant ecosystems that are going to probably go to, to customers and try to offer together an offering rather than individually because they can do more. And that is interesting too. Who should you team up with? I think you need to think about that, not only what you can do. Okay, so we were talking a bit about the potential opportunities and potential threats. Uh, we can also see certain traps uh, in the industry when you're trying to shift in the, towards digitalization. So the first one, too slow digital transformation. Um, I guess the key thing that we want to say here is basically the largest risk that a company is facing is actually to not be acting, to not do anything about it. Um, there was a recent survey by um, Forbes and 72% of global CEOs believe that their industry will shame, uh, the next three years will be more critical for their industry than the last 50. So, 
you know, things are moving and things are moving fast. And if you looked at all those technological shifts, if you're not on this train and not uh, taking the action, then I think it, you're, yeah, you may lose a lot of your competitiveness quite soon. On the other hand, number two of our traps, development of digital solutions without understanding the customer value. Well, so you can't just run in there and try to push your technology. I think that is a key challenge that we've seen from many companies. You know, too much technology focus and too little business. You have your engineers that are so enthusiastic about the potential of the technology and, oh, we have this digital platform and we can monitor this and that, but you know, what value are you really creating for the customer? So I have an example here, and I think this is a good one. Uh, I think many customers in mining industry feel that nowadays the machines cost almost you know, 30, 40% more and comes with functionalities that they don't want to really know how to use even. But you know, it's a combined offering. You can't really take this off. And from a customer point of view, what are they really paying for? Very expensive digital product that is not really being able to be used in their setup. And you know, it's natural. This is, it's not easy sitting in the back end R&D and trying to come up with new things and everything is moving so, so quickly. So, to really understand what is the customer and what is the end user and what are their needs. But it's, it's actually vital uh, to evaluate, to think critically about what would the customer really be willing to pay for. So value proposition canvas can of course be a good tool in, in these type of uh, solutions. But uh, I, I think this quote has actually was quite uh, illustrative or something that we've seen quite a lot, you know, that, Okay, so the provider comes in and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that their system is highly advanced with a lot of functionalities, but I want, what I want to see is how does these functionalities really play into my operations, my business? How will it make it more profitable? And that they haven't been able to show. You know, they charge more, but they charge me maybe even 50% more, but what is really the value that the customer is getting out of it? We have actually studied an uh, uh, array of failed cases where we have tried to capture why did they fail, and it's quite an interesting study as well. The third trap, uh, understanding the real effect of a changed business model in a digital age. And I think as you introduce a new business model, what also happens is there are a lot of unexpected factors that play in. At a simplistic level, the customer behavior change as you go towards performance or availability-based contract, for example. You could also have new delivery process needs to be managed and not the capabilities to be actually able to do that. You know, you are also guaranteeing multiple years of operations. This is quite heavy cost and guarantees and, you know, to be able to deliver on that is not easy. And I think what would happen also to a larger extent is that you're going to cannibalize your existing models if you haven't thought it through. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe that is just a transformation part that you need to go through. But as long as you have thought it through, how it would be played out is very important. So now we move towards uh, five learnings and we have four minutes to go. <laughs> um, so I wanna start with one important thing, of course, people drives change. Um, so of course we're seeing all these technological and business shifts. So servitization, automation, digitalization, electrification. And of course, in the center is this business model innovation. And, you know, what is really happening in the organizations in, in that case? Well, okay, so the, all these are creating a lot of opportunities for innovation, but it's also creating organizational resistance because it's threatening a lot of the existing competence base within the workforce and the responsibilities and roles that people have been used to. You know, I was talking to people uh, they were describing quite a bit about, you know, when we're shifting to these electrified vehicles, what really happens to the whole mechanical department that has been de developing the drivetrain? They're not going to be happy about it. They're going to try to shoot it down in every meeting in R&D where they try to get an increased budget. So it, it can be quite challenging for these innovations to su uh, survive and it can create a lot of inertia and resistance in organizations. So, okay, if you are an individual, that are really believe in the technology, believe in the potential of digital or autonomous, how can you cope with this type of organizational resistance? Um, mm -hmm. We did a study recently uh, with one of our PhD candidates looking into this and uh, 
definitely we could identify certain strategies. So one was, of course, evangelizing, uh, basically going out preaching to the organization, trying to convince and build awareness for the need of change and convincing others to go into it. And I guess this is what senior management would typically be doing uh, in many of our large companies. But you could also see people coming in from, from lower levels and, and, and trying to drive these changes. Uh, another strategy that is maybe a bit more fun, bootlegging. So working totally covertly and without authorization, maybe you know, working on a, a digital project on somebody else's budget or <laughs> stealing some funds out from a uh, coffee funder. It, it's, I, we have seen, witnessed quite a lot of interesting strategies here that people do to, to get the things moving. And, and I think companies need that. Uh, I was talking to a research director and he said, you know, I, I know that many of my workers are doing this and I know I shouldn't condone it, but if I don't, I'm really scared about how we will survive up here because it's too bureaucratic if you're in a big global firm and to try to get these innovations going. So that's a very important strategy. Of course, collaborating or finding ways of building some legitimacy for, for your initiative, aligning to somebody else, other person's strategy. What is really happening out in the business units that you can uh, align to, to make sure that your initiative gets pulled. And also leveraging on existing resources in different ways to what, what was happening in the, in the latest project, for example. I really like this individual level analysis. Uh, it's quite exciting to meet those bootleggers. <laughs> Uh, I think one challenge with digitalization is also that if you would talk with people who are initiating many of these, uh, are part of this initiation, they would talk about, we can do this and we can do that and, you know, this could be done and that could be done. The opportunities are a lot. There are a lot of opportunities. The question lies, which of those opportunities really matter in terms of profiting? And also, as I was talking about cannibalization, how would you place this digital business model in relation to the existing business model? And I think that is a very important question because each organization has maybe a bag filled with certain cash. You can't invest into everything. But then finding out that opportunity is very important. Uh, what we have been also thinking about to a larger extent is that quite often you can be having many initiatives with customers and you might be thinking about going ahead and doing something. And in those particular states, before you sign the contract, it could be nice to a little bit step back because you kind of have a background to what customer would like you to do and evaluate this business model. And we came up with like a three-step model uh, inspired by our study where we talked about three steps that could actually be very interesting. So the first one is very much about opportunity assessment, kind of ensure that what would be the effect of it, what would be the spread of this opportunity being pursued within the organization. How would you analyze the risks? I think quite often we go through this step very quickly because we believe that we know the risks. But as I was trying to talk about, we are faced with totally new risks because the offer has changed. And there may be worthwhile to kind of look into that as well. And of course, looking into financial part of it and kind of doing some sensitivity analysis and figuring out, you know, is there a profit to be made and how to reassure that? And that could be a possibility for a go or no go kind of a decision before uh, signing the contract, for example. Another one I think is quite interesting is that uh, I think many companies need to take a little bit step back towards digital uh, business models in terms of services. So I think a concept that you know, we, we kind of like a lot is around microservices. And this whole idea is quite simple, but actually quite powerful to a larger extent. And I think the whole idea resonates in terms of that instead of going with a totally <coughs> packaged offer towards customers, what is probably needed and would be probably a critical part of all digital offering is to be working closely with customers and designing those microservices. So an example could be, you know, looking through a list of challenges in let's say an open query and you try to identify where could you make the highest gain. And maybe that is towards, you know, load or weight loading uh, or inadequate weight loading and you know, CO2 emission. And what we think is quite interesting in this particular case can be that you want to hit the target as soon as possible with limited effort as much as you can do in-house and then try to build trust because that is what you're doing. I mean, you're trying to build trust. You're trying to develop your portfolio and you're also doing it in an agile way. And I think this could be a nice way to think about how you develop a service portfolio in a digitalization age. 
Um, so of course we're talking also about uh, you know, how do you really de deliver value on these solutions. And um, one thing that we have definitely seen is that you know, it, it has changed quite a lot if you think about the archi architecture of value creation. So from maybe having the product in the center, I think what is really core to a lot of uh, companies and how they want to create value is actually the information or the digital platforms that you have as a core module. And then you can configure the offerings in different way. You can have different product modules and different service modules to, to meet the outcomes. Um, and um, we can also think about different, different roles in, in this value chain, in, in how you develop offerings and, and, and configure them, but also in, in the delivery. And of course, I wanted to zoom in a little bit more into the delivery aspects here and what the back end and the front end would actually be utilizing digital platform for. Uh, so if we're talking about the, the delivery aspects, I think a key challenge, of course, is, is to make that efficient throughout the globe, not only here in Sweden, in Vestoros. You also need to be able to offer the same type of service in Nigeria or Australia. And, um, so from that perspective, a lot of standardization from the back end will be important. Developing applications for analyzing the customer's usage and data for uh, ensuring delivery support in the different front end uses. Uh, also identifying and sharing different best practices. So, so what they are doing in Nigeria, maybe they have come up with a very advanced way of uh, uh, planning for service because of, let's say they have poor road conditions or uh, something. So, so they really have to th think about it. And if, if they have that, of course, you wanna try to capture that and be able to distribute learnings through the digital platform in some way. On the front end, of course, you really need to ensure that service technicians and everyone are utilizing the digital platform for optimizing their delivery processes because otherwise it's typically not going to make sense. Um, you have built the whole offering around the fact that you have a lot more data and a lot more understanding of the, of the equipment, of the customer's usage and all that. But if you're not using that, I think you're quite soon going to be losing money uh, on your service contracts or maybe I'm not even making the sales. So monitoring the usage data to improve the customer's operations uh, and decrease their life cycle. So you're really being able to create value for them. I guess then you have the potential of having a more profitable service delivery and operational efficiency as well as customization towards the customer's organization. The final point we wanted to talk a little bit about is that how do you align incentives between two actors? And I think at the core of it, you need to think about that uh, or co what companies need is a different form of engagement, a different structure in which they are ac actually able to co-create value. And something that we have been starting to little bit study on, and especially in these those strategic initiatives between a supplier and a customer has to do with relational contract. Um, I think this is a quite interesting setup which can allow for you to work closely with customer and actually co-creating value rather than trying to define everything up front in step one. And as you can understand with digitalization, you know, you need to actually work in a creative way, uh, even just optimizing a process, you know, many things can come up and many things can change. So of course, from customer point of view, you know, they are very much focusing on innovation. Uh, for most customers, it's always about lowering the cost for gaining more productivity or, you know, very tangible gains. But they are also open towards, you know, better business models. And this is a discussion we are actually mainly having with customers. How should they organize themselves to be able to receive offerings from their suppliers? And I think that is a good progressive thinking to a large extent. And in this particular contracting setup, you know, you need to work with, you know, focus on results rather than on single transactions. I mean, some guiding rules, focus on what rather than how. You know, what would be the desirable outcome and how it should be measured? Uh, you know, to give an example to you, you could think about uptime gains, you can think about productivity gain, you can think about performance gain, you know, what particular measurements is the best for the contract that customer would like to pay for and you are able to deliver on. And that may not always be the obvious ones. And that is something to be defined together. Of course, the pricing model, you know, how do you operate on that? You know, how, should it be flexible? Should it be a risk and revenue sharing contract? How should it be designed? And finally, I think this is a very big one, governance. 
So one of the biggest fear for many customers right now is that we may allow a provider to come and actually offer us a digital solution and we can sign that contract. But how can we be sure that over the three year period, what they have offered to us and the value they have generated is, let's say, better than the value is better and the cost is lower than what was going to be offered if we just bought it as a product. And that is a very complex part of the discussion. And, you know, this governance structure kind of needs to enable that transparency, but also provide incentives for continuous innovation within the engagement. And that is not always easy to design, but very important because, you know, these contracts can run over three to five years sometimes. Okay, so the key, key takeaway uh, that we wanted to tell you guys. So digitalization is much more complex than the technology and the potential applications. It's about redesigning and redefining both technology, processes, people, and business models, not only your own, but also together with your ecosystem partners. And I think what this picture illustrates to a larger extent is like, you know, to view that there are many digital opportunities, but how you're going to configure your technology process, people and partners to achieve increased value, revenue, but also social benefits. So start looking for opportunities and involve your ecosystem partners. Thank you. So we would move into the second part of the presentation where we have